Now that we have the HTML for our website completed, we're going to work on the CSS. I'll start off by just making some basic tag rules so that I can format the page accordingly. I'll begin by making a universal selector that's going to zero out the padding and margin. Then I'll create a body tag that sets the font family, the background color to a light gray, the overall width to 940 pixels, I'll use margin on the top and the bottom of zero and auto for the right and the left to center my fixed width content, and then I'm going to add some padding on the top and the bottom of 20 pixels. Next, I'll add a rule for both H1 and H2. I'm going to size these headers the same, so we'll make them have a font size of 2.2 M's, the line height will be 2.4, and it's worth noting on line height you don't have to put any units of measurement. This is one of the few properties where you don't have to specify units of measurement. That gets inherited from the font size. We're going to specify padding on the top of 10 pixels and the bottom, and right and left will be zero. Now we'll set a rule for our H3. For the H3, we'll set the font size to 1.2 M's, line height of 1.5, and, and padding on the top and the bottom of 5 and 0 for the right and the left. And finally, I'll make a rule for my paragraphs. I'm going to use a font size of 0.8 M's, line height of 1.2, and padding on the bottom of 20 pixels. If we save now and look in the browser, you can just see that some of the basic formatting has been set for my page. Next, we'll make some styles for the main navigation. So you might have recalled that on the main navigation, we assigned an ID of main to this nav tag. I'll use that as part of my selector in my CSS. I'm going to use nav hash main, and the properties that we're going to specify are the background color of being a dark gray. I'll use 333. I'm going to set the width to 100% and I'm going to use position of absolute and a left value of zero. What I'm going to end up creating is a bar that's going to span the entire width of the browser no matter what its size. Because I'm using this particular rule of setting the overall width to 100%, I need the content to stay structured in the center. If I save right now and we look in the browser real quickly, you can see that I do get this gray bar, but you can see that my links over here are slammed into the left-hand side. And if I were to zoom out, or in essence make my page wider, you can see that the links are going to stay on the left. I need them to line up with the rest of the content on the site. So to do that, we'll make a rule for the main UL and I'm going to set the overall width to 940. That overall width is going to match the overall width of the body tag that we specified. Margin is going to be 0 for the top and bottom and auto for the right and the left. That's just going to center the content. And I'll remove the bullets here by using a list style type of none. Next I'll make a rule that will cause the navigational elements to appear side by side. And we'll just use a float of left on the main li items. So now my navigational links will appear side by side, like so. I know it's hard to see them right now because we have to change the color, but if I highlight this, you can see where they now exist and how they all appear side by side. Let's put a little bit of formatting on the link tags. I'm going to set their font size to be 0.9 M's, line height of 1.2, and I'll set the font color to 999. I'm going to remove the underline and tell these to display as block level elements. We're going to set an overall width of 140 pixels and I'll text align the text to the center as well as adding a margin on the right of 20 pixels just to separate these links out a little bit. So when we refresh in the browser you can see that now they're slightly spaced out. I think I need to make those a little bit lighter. Let's just use the hex value here of B6, B6, B6 which is the slightly lighter shade of gray that will allow these to be a little bit more apparent. That's better. Let's give a little bit more vertical height here. I can do that by increasing my line height. I'm going to change that to 1.5 and if we save now and refresh you'll see how these have a little bit more vertical height. I'm going to make a rule for the hover and we'll just have the text color become white when our links are hovered over. So now that looks pretty good. Next we'll move on to this section of the page. As you recall, in our HTML, we've given this section 
a ID of intro and this just contains an H2 and an H3. We're going to actually make this appear as a graphic header but we'll put most of the styles in with the CSS. The selector I'm going to use here is going to be section hash intro which is the ID name of this section. I'm going to set the background to display an image and we're going to use shorthand notation here so I'll just put background so that I can pass on more parameters than just the background image. Then I'm going to use URL and I'm going to point to an image that I've created. The image is just a small only five pixel high strip of an image that is 653 pixels wide and you can see from the little preview here it goes from green to a yellowy green color. Because I'm using background I can also pass on some other values here so we're gonna tell this to repeat in Y which will repeat it vertically and I'm gonna position it at the right and the top and then I'm gonna set my background color to green so the image is going to be kind of locked up to the upper right hand corner of this particular intro section and then I'm just filling with a background color of green which is the same color of green that I'm using in the far left of my image. Let's just add some other styles here to add a little bit of padding and margin and if I save and we look in the browser you can see that I get a green to kind of limey yellow green gradient that fills. My image is only about this long. If I temporarily change the background color here from this shade to red for instance then you'll see exactly where the image ends and then I'm filling the rest of that div with the same color green that I have at the left edge of my image. This is saving me a tiny little bit of file size because my image doesn't have to be this long it only has to be the 653 which is the width that I need to make this gradient transition like it is. I'll set the background color back to that green. In addition to what we have right here we're going to add a rounded corner to this particular file. Rounded corners are created by using a CSS3 property called border radius. So I'm going to use border dash radius and I'm going to set the border radius to 20 pixels. If I save now and we go look in the browser you'll see that this particular area of my image now has rounded corners. Border radius is a great way to be able to create corners that are rounded and as you increase the number value the rounded corners will become more rounded. I'm going to take you over to can I use and I'm going to type in border radius and this will let you know the browsers that support border radius. So you can see that it's fairly well supported in most of the current browsers. IE supports it until we get down to IE 8 and all the rest of the browsers have pretty good support. If I show all you can see that most of the other browsers have supported it for quite some time. Now even though border radius is well supported in most of our modern browsers, it's probably beneficial to include some fallback content for older versions of WebKit and Mozilla browsers. You do this by specifying the WebKit and Mozilla vendor prefix rules. The one for Mozilla is moz dash and then usually you'll just pass on the same name, in this case border radius and I'm going to set the value to the same 20 pixels. Then I'm going to do one for WebKit. It's dash WebKit dash and then we'll pass on the border radius property just like we did before. These vendor prefixes ensure that older versions of both WebKit and Mozilla browsers will render the border radius appropriately. And even from our check on caniuse.com you can see that we don't really have a lot of the older browsers that aren't supporting this feature but I want to introduce you to the concept of vendor prefixes because there are some other rules that you might encounter where vendor prefixes are going to become more important. What I recommend is that you do your research and check the CSS3 property that you want to apply and try to find out if the vendor prefix is necessary or not. In addition to rounding the corners, we're also going to add a shadow. I'll go back to can I use for a minute and we'll search for box shadow. 
Box shadow is a way that I can display inner or outer shadow effects to various elements. Once again, you can see that the support is pretty well in most of the browsers. IE8 is when this will start to fall apart. When you use box shadow, you're just going to type box dash shadow, and then you have several values that you need to pass on. The first value is going to be the horizontal shadow. We're going to set our horizontal shadow to 4 pixels. The next value is going to be the vertical shadow. And again, I'm going to use 4 pixels. If I wanted to change the direction of the shadow, I could use negative numbers. Presently, my shadow is going to be on the right and the bottom part of my image. If I wanted it to be on the upper left, I would change these values to negative values. The next value that we need to include is going to be the blur amount. The higher the number, the more blurred it will be, and the farther out the shadow will extend. If I want a shadow to be very hard edged, I would set the number to zero, and it'll be a very sharp edge. The final required value is going to be the color of the shadow, and here we're just going to use 777, which is a mid-tone gray. If I save and I preview this in my browser, you can see that I get a nice drop shadow that appears in the lower right-hand area. This is a great and very efficient way that you can create effects like shadows on various elements. These values that I've specified here are all required values. The horizontal offset, the vertical offset, the blur radius, and the color. In addition to these values, you can also include a spread radius. The spread radius will increase the size of the shadow if you use positive numbers, and negative values will decrease the size of the shadow. Once again, when you use box shadow, if necessary, you may want to include the vendor prefixes, dash moz dash, and dash webkit dash, and you can just specify the exact same values. Whenever you do specify vendor prefixes, make sure to define those first and then define the actual un-vendor prefixed version of the property. We want to set it up in this way so that when vendor prefixes are no longer needed, the final rule that the browser encounters will just be the default accepted rule. The last thing we're going to apply on our section intro is going to be a position of relative. And we're just doing this because we're going to want to absolutely position an element within it. I just realized that I forgot to add a little bit of HTML to my page. In addition to what we have inside of section intro, we need to add one more line of HTML code. This is going to be an article tag, which will contain a paragraph and also point to an image. Let me just add that in quickly. After my closing header, I'm going to insert the article tag. And as I mentioned, the article is going to contain a paragraph, and then it's going to point to an image that I've created to use on this particular page. The image is just going to be a round badge that says HTML5, and I've actually made the image fairly large on a transparent background so that I can place it where I want it to be. Now that I have the image on there and the paragraph text, let's see what we have in the browser. Okay, you can see what's happening here. I have my image. We actually want to place the image up here in the upper right hand corner. That's why we're using the position of relative on this section area. We'll absolutely position this and then we'll control the width of the H tags and the paragraph tag. Let's do that next. I'm going to use a specific selector of section hash intro image and I'm going to tell this to position absolutely. I'm going to position it 20 pixels from the top and 60 pixels from the right edge. If we save now, you're going to see that my image graphic is now going to move to this location. Now we'll make a rule that sets the headers to have a width of 500 pixels as well as the paragraph. This is going to ensure that these items don't crash into the image. Next I'm going to make some more specific rules for my H2, my H3, and my paragraph. I'm just setting things like line height, font color, padding, and font weight. I'm going to save and we'll look in the browser. Now you can see that the content has been formatted. I'm just going to add a little more height to this area of my file and I can do that by going back into the rule that we already have for the section intro and I'm going to add a little bit more padding to the bottom. So I'll leave the padding at 44 pixels for the top and the right and the left but on the bottom I'm going to change it to 65 pixels. Now you can just see I get a little more height. Now my text looks really small and that's because I'm zoomed out. If I view at actual size, my file looks something like this. 
I'll keep my files slightly zoomed out so that you can kind of get the big picture. The next area that we're going to format is going to be our aside area. I want this to appear on the right and I want to give it a fixed width. So let's specify that next. I'm going to set the float on the right and a width of 320 pixels and I'll use a top margin of 90 pixels just to create some additional space from the intro section and the aside. Next I'm going to make some more specific rules for the aside sections. If you recall in our HTML within our aside tag I have two sections and each of the sections contain navigation. I want to style these so that they are visually displayed in their own little boxes. I'm going to do that by creating a more specific selector of a side section. I'll set the margin on the top to 20 pixels, right to 0, bottom 0, and left to 20 pixels. Then I'm going to set padding of 10 pixels on the top and the bottom and 20 pixels on the right and the left. I'll set the background color to a light gray and then I'm going to do a slight rounded corner border radius of 10 pixels. If we save and look in the browser, you can see that these elements are now styled like this. Let's make some rules for the lists and for the links. We're going to remove the bullets, set some margin settings, and on the links we'll change the color, we'll get rid of the underline, and we're going to have the links display as block level elements to make them easier to click. I'm using a selector of a side UL and I'm going to remove the bullets and set the margin on the left to 20 pixels. For my A tags I'm going to set the color to black, remove the underline, display of block, and a margin of 4 pixels, and on hover the underline will come back. If we save and look in the browser now, you can see that now my links are styled like this. The next element that we want to look at on our page is going to be the blog post section. We're going to format this so that the text is going to display inside of two columns. The first thing I'll do is I'll set an overall width for this particular section on my page. I'm going to use a selector of section hash blog post and set the width to 620 pixels. Then I'll format the H2s within this area. I'm going to give them a line height of 1.2, a padding on the bottom of 0, and a margin on the top of 10 pixels. I'm going to make a rule for my header paragraph and also for the header A tag. If you look in the HTML, this particular section contains a header. I want to style the paragraph and the A tag uniquely here. So that's why I'm using this multiple selector. I'm going to set the font color to gray, the font size to 0.85ms, and the font style to italic. And then when the user hovers over, we'll change the font color to black and we'll set the text decoration to none. If we save now and look in the browser, you're going to see that this area will change. There we go. I've tucked this closer to the headline, changed the color, make it italic, and also changed the link. Now let's move on to the article portion of the page. Remember that we want this to display in two columns. Normally we would use floats for columns, but we're going to be using a CSS3 property called column count. Let's check its acceptance in can I use. You can see that when I put in column count, this particular CSS3 property is not completely supported yet. IE 10 and 11 fully support it, but most of the other browsers only offer partial support. And if I hover over, you can see that for Firefox it tells me partial support with prefix of dash moz dash. This is an instance where this particular property will not work in the modern Firefox, Chrome, or Safari browsers without the vendor prefix. So we need to be sure to add it to this particular rule. We'll start off by using the selector of blog post article. I'm going to tell this to have a column count of 2. If I save the page right now and we go look in our browser, you're going to see that nothing has changed. And just like we read on can I use, this property does not work without our vendor prefix. So let's add the vendor prefix back in. Remember the vendor prefixes always have to come before the actual code, so I'll use dash moz dash for Mozilla, dash webkit dash for webkit browsers, and we actually have a dash o dash for Opera. If you're targeting Opera users, you can put that in there as well. If I save now and we refresh in the browser, you can see that now my content flows into two columns. In addition to column count, we also have column gap. Column gap is where you can control the spacing on the gutter. 
The gutter is the spacing between the columns. Column gap requires that you use the vendor prefix as well, so we'll place that on our page. I'm going to set the column gap or the gutter to 25 pixels, and I'm also going to use a text align of justify. This is going to make my text justify throughout the two columns. If we go back into the browser now and refresh, you can see that I get beautiful columns that fill these two areas. Even though this isn't fully supported without the vendor prefixes, this is a great enhancement to add to a web page. Now you can see that the older versions of IE, IE9, as well as anything lower, is not going to support it. So what happens on those browsers that don't support the new features? Well, they simply just ignore it. So instead of appearing in two columns, this will, content will just appear in one column. It's not really a deal breaker. Obviously our page is not going to look as good as it does now, but this is an instance where we're going to be using progressive enhancement. Progressive enhancement is the theory that you will progressively enhance the page based on the capabilities of the browser. You don't want to make it so that users with older browsers would be unable to use the page. You just want to make it so that they can still read all the content and do whatever they need to do on the page, but if they have a newer browser, they'll get a more enhanced and possibly visually more appealing version of the site. That's what we're working for at this point. The next thing that I want to do is I want to style my figure and my fig caption. This is my fig caption and it doesn't really look like a caption for our image. So let's set some of those specifications now. The first thing I'll do is I'll set the overall figure width and I'm going to place a margin on the bottom. I'll do that by just targeting my figure tag and I'm going to set the width to 284 pixels and a margin on the bottom of 10 pixels. Then I'll make a rule for fig caption. On fig caption I'm going to define things like the font color, the font style, the font size, a margin on the top, and I'm going to text align center. When I save and when we refresh in the browser you can see that now the caption looks more like a caption. So I'm uniquely able to hook that area and style it accordingly. So our page is coming together quite nicely. We're moving on to the comments section next. The first thing I'm going to want to do on the comments section is I'm going to want to clear the float. Remember that we had done a float of right on our aside. Now currently on our page, because this content does not go past the column of text, it's not a problem. But we want to build this into the page anyways, especially because this is essentially our template for the blog site. We don't know how long the article is going to be or how long these links would be. At some point these might extend past the article and if they do so, the float is going to affect the subsequent content. So we'll just use a clear so that we can ensure that that is not going to be an issue. I'm going to set a one pixel rule line on the top and I'm just setting some margin and some padding settings to space out this area of the website. All right, the next thing that I want to do is I want this content down here, the poster's name and their date, and then their comment to appear in two columns. We're going to do this by using a trick of using CSS to force these items to work as a table. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my article in this area of my website to display as a table. So I'm going to use section hash comments space article. I'm going to tell it to display as a table and I'll just add some padding all the way around of 20 pixels. Next, we're going to select the header within the article and we're going to tell this to act like a table cell and we'll pass on some additional parameters like width. My selector is going to be section hash comments article header. I'll tell it to display as a table cell. I'll give it a width value of 200 pixels. I'm going to set padding on the right to give it a little bit of space from the additional content. I'm going to set my font size and my font color. Next, I'm going to style the links that are within this section. I'm going to tell the links to display as block level. This will force the links to be on their own line and the rest of the content will be on the next line a font weight of bold and a color of black. When you hover over, the underline will disappear. If we save our page right now and look in the browser, you're going to see that the rules that we just made create a two column layout here. They also force the link, the poster's name, which is a link, to be on its own row and then the text appears underneath it. This is coming together quite well. 
Once again, because this is going to be ultimately a dynamically created page, we don't really know how many comments we will get at any given time. If we get a bunch of comments, it would be easier to separate these visually by using some sort of zebra striping type of thing, where we want every other comment to maybe be styled slightly differently. We can use this by using the nth child selector. If we look in our HTML and go to the comment section, you can see that each comment is wrapped inside of an article tag. So every time we have a comment, it's going to be surrounded by an article tag. Knowing that, I'm going to use a selector of the article, but I'm going to tell it to get every other one by using something called nth child. The selector that we're going to use is going to be hash comments space article colon nth dash child and then I pass on a parameter. In this case I'm going to select every even one. You can also pass on the parameter of odd and you can even do more advanced selecting types in here as well. What we're going to do as far as our CSS properties is we're going to set the background color, we're going to set a border, and we we'll, might as well just make this a, have rounded corners as well. So I'll set the background color to a light gray, I'm going to set the border to a slightly darker gray, and I'm adding a border radius of 10. If we save now and refresh in the browser, you can see that every other comment now appears inside of a rounded gray box. This is the result of that nth child selector. Next we'll style the footer on the page. The footer is going to have a dark background color, just like the nav bar at the top, and we're also going to have this fill the entire width of the screen much like we did on the navigation. So I'm going to use a background color of 222, a width of 100%, margin top of 20 pixels, position of absolute, and left of zero. You might remember, but in our HTML when we created the footer, we surrounded all of the content inside of the footer inside of a div. And I mentioned then that the only reason that we did this is because we want to use this as a specific hook. So we'll make a rule and we'll set the fixed width on the footer div. We're going to set the footer div to have a width of 940 pixels, a margin on the top and the bottom of 0, and right and left of auto. We'll set some padding on the top and the bottom, and we'll tell this to display as a table. We're going to set up similar columns, the same that we did on our comments, by using that display of table cell. We'll do that on the sections that are inside of the footer. We have three sections inside of our footer, so each area of the footer is surrounded inside of a section tag, as you can see right here. So for our selector, we'll use footer section. We'll tell them to display as table cells and have widths of 30 pixels. Then I'm just going to set the font color for my H3s and my paragraphs of the footer to be white. Since the background color is dark, I want to make sure that the color of the text shows up. I'm going to set all my links in this area to have a color of light gray and when they're hovered over the color will change to white and the underline will disappear on our links. Then I'm going to want to change the bullets in this area. This is what my page looks like so far. We're going to change the bullets in this area both the color and the style. So currently they're little black dots. Let's make a rule that will customize these slightly. I'm going to target the footer UL. I'm going to change the list style type to square. This is going to make the bullets appear square. I'm setting the color of the bullets to a medium gray and I'm going to set some margin on the left for the bullets and a font size. If we save and look inside of the browser you can see that now we've done some slight indenting. The bullets appear as little gray squares, and that looks much better. The final thing that I want to do is my about text is kind of crashing into other resources. It's far too tight right here, so let's create a little spacing there. In the HTML, I had originally placed a section ID of resources on the middle section. We're going to use that as a hook and we're just going to set some padding on the left. So I'll just set the padding on the left to 50 pixels. Now if I save and go look in the browser, you can see that this content gets pushed over. That's it for our blog post page. You can see that we've used some new CSS techniques and we've formatted the page to be HTML5 
taking advantage of the semantic markup that HTML5 has to offer. Hopefully you've learned a lot of great techniques in this lesson and you'll be able to apply them to your future projects. Good luck!